quite nervous, actually. Hello. Hello, Andrew, it's Callum. You're OK? Hello, mate, how are you? I'm all right. We're basically making a film about the, the, the black and Asian experience in the British Army. Yeah. Um, and we've we've been looking uh, sort of at, at a couple of, of incidents, and, and your name's come up. OK. Because we've already got the other version of events from, from the victim, so we need, we need, we need yours, really. <laughs> no chance. No chance. I've had this before. I ended up in prison in Cyprus in a city of the Turkish prison, and I have it over. <sighs> Didn't expect that. The British Army is working hard to recruit young people, targeting minorities in their adverts. I grew up on the outskirts of Brighton and Hove, in a mainly white working class area. I know people who have signed up. Growing up, you regard these guys as heroes. A lot of them have served tours abroad. I've got a lot of respect for them. But black and Asian people born in Britain are less likely to be soldiers than their white counterparts. And some say the problem is racism. Two former paratroopers have won their case for racial harassment against the British Army. The bottom line is this. There is no place in the British Army whatsoever for any form of racism. I pack my bags and say I'm leaving. Getting out of the army. I don't want to be here. More race cards are pulled out than actual racist events. If you are a serving soldier and you hold these intolerant and extremist views, there is no place for you in the British Army. So get out. I want to find out how deep racism runs in the army and whether it changes how I've always felt about our soldiers. So I'm looking at an article here from November 2018. It's titled, British Soldier Recruited for Far-Right Group While in Army. This is Miko Vevelainen. He was a member of the banned far-right organisation, National Action. He wanted to build a whites-only society and was stockpiling weapons in preparation for a race war, all while serving as a corporal in the British Army, including tours in Afghanistan. Vivalainen's now in jail, but Mark Barrett, a 24-year-old soldier, was tried alongside him. He was eventually found not guilty. So this Mark Barrett, who apparently had a cardboard swastika openly displayed on his window at Alexander Barracks in Cyprus, is someone we've been trying to get hold of for months now. His stepdad has agreed to speak to us. Alan? Hi, come on in, Callum. Good to see you. There he is. There he is. Well, he was only 16 when he went to Harrogate, you see? So that would have been taken 16, 17 years old. So young. This was his oath of allegiance. So I remember. Oh, God, it looks even younger yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, little piece in the, the local paper. He said, I do not think Afghanistan will be as bad as people make out. I know it's dangerous out there, but it's what I've signed up to do. Quite um, innocent, you could say. Yeah, very. Maybe naive almost. Absolutely, yeah. So this Vivalainen, he served with Mark and was yes. two ranks above him? He was two ranks above him. He worked in... He wasn't in the same unit, but he worked in the next building. Unfortunately, Mark's got very blonde hair, blue eyes, um, very Aryan-looking. Uh, and the very first thing that Vivalainen said to Mark when upon meeting was, you're Nazi Mark. And that stuck. But he was the guy that was then getting Mark involved in more extreme humour. Several times when he's been here, um, you know, we've had to tell him to sort of calm down a little bit and, and, and not be so shouty. I mean, in the summer, we have our windows open and making comments about Asians <laughs> isn't good in our environment and our neighbourhood. Is that because the line is warped in the army? The soldiers are taught to fight our enemies, who will be other nationalities. So, you know, racism in some level is, is, is almost inherent and built into the, their training. It kind of has to be. It's easy to judge from the outside. Alan obviously just wants to protect his stepson, and I do have empathy for him. 
he feels his stepson was being groomed from above. I don't know how racist this extreme humour Mark took part in actually was, but off the back of meeting Alan, Mark's agreed to talk. Hi, Hi mate, you're right. How are you doing? Yeah, good, how are you? Hello, good to see you. Good. Do you want to come in? Cheers. Mark spent six months in a high security prison, charged with membership of National Action, before a jury set him free. However, he lost his army career. I mean, why, why did you want to join the army? At the time, believe it or not, I was, I was very quiet, um, kept to myself. I didn't do well in school, I got bullied and stuff. And it just seemed to fit what I wanted to do in life. So I joined up. But other than that, I don't really know why. <laughs> Tell us about Vivalainen. Did you like him? What did you think of him? Um, I took him pretty much as any other person. His racist humour and racist jokes were perhaps a bit higher than everybody else, whereas another soldier might make different jokes of different things, not just racism. He was pretty much all racism. Vivalainen was asking you to draw swastikas and stuff. Did, yeah. Were alarm bells not ringing then? All I thought with him was that he was interested in his old history and stuff, because he had books and all sorts of bits and bobs. Um, and he just asked me to draw him a picture, so I did. The group chat that you were added to, what sort of things were people saying? How dark was it getting? They were really bad, racist, anti-Semitic sort of jokes. Um, these are even words that I never knew of. Um, I didn't know what anti-Semitism was. I mean, do you not hold any sort of responsibility? I mean, I do, but that's 90% of the British Army. If they went through everyone's phones in the British Army, we wouldn't have an army anymore. And that's probably the thing that's left me the most bitter is, why me? You know, why not the next soldier or the next soldier after that? He's not the skinhead covered in tattoos that I expected to meet. And I'm still unclear what exactly it was he was sharing or laughing at on this messaging group. But his messages were presented as evidence against him in court, so I've got hold of them. This is what Mark has described to me as dark humour. He posted images of the Ku Klux Klan and of a black male hanging from a tree. An image of women and children next to a train with the slogan, all aboard the Juju train. Another image he posted of US President Donald Trump with the slogan, Spix and N-word need to hang from trees. He's also said this, eventually the world will see them for what they are and the war will begin. No sorrow or remorse for those sickening degenerates. I mean, some of this stuff I can't even read out. I'm left wondering what it's like to be on the receiving end of such abuse. Within the army, minorities are more likely to complain about bullying, harassment and discrimination than their fellow white soldiers. Here he is. David, he's massive. Look at the size of him. I can't go to the gym with this guy. Let's yeah. go. Come on, I'm, I'm stepping out next one. Let's go. I'm strong. Up. Two more. Let's go, Timothy. Try. Thirty-four-year-old David says that for him, raising concerns about racism in the army made things worse. How good a soldier were you? I was uh, named best recruit, so that says it all, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Uh, did you have a nickname? Yeah, Black Dave. I've never called him that. <laughs> <laughs> we did have another Dave within the platoon, but he was English and he was white, so... You didn't mind being called Black Dave, but when did it go too far? As I said, I mean, he's a going person. If it's just banter, it's just banter. You know, I'll probably laugh at it 90% of the time. But with the senior, you know, if you say something, you get court martialed, you get shitty jobs. That's why a lot of people don't want to talk, because you talk, your career is screwed. Particularly from your senior colleagues, the, the racial slurs that you weren't comfortable with, which you complained about and continued. That certain person was breathing down my neck, whether it's on a Friday night when you're getting ready to disperse, you know, I found myself doing extra duties. You know, he can nominate anyone to do those duties. If I'd done the duties last week, someone else surely should be doing the duties this week. But I found myself on continuous duties every Friday, going home really late, called me a black cunt in front of everyone, and no one said nothing. Really? Yeah, you know? I think that was the most part that pushed me to the, to the edge. Oh. 
at last. <sighs> How did you actually get out of the arm in the end? After the incident, I signed a form um, giving the reason why I wanted to leave, which was racial, racial discrimination. And my superiors at the time told me that if I was to change the reason why I wanted to leave, they would guarantee my early release. I just wanted to get out, I was fed up. So I changed my original reason, which was racial discrimination, to a medical reason. Former colleagues of David back up his story. But they were afraid that they'd lose the trust of army friends by speaking out. Only one was willing to go on camera. Joe Collinson joined when he was just 17 and served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we have Rothman. Say hello, Rothman Collinson. Hello, Rothman Collinson. All right, Joe. Hello, Good to see you. Good, mate. Did you know David then? Yeah. Yeah. We were based in a checkpoint, basically, um, Checkpoint Chaparac, uh, which was where our battalion was based out there. Out there for the suntan, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of soldier was he? He was made for it. Yeah. He had, you know, he had the strength, he had the mentality, he had the, the drive to actually want to be a soldier. Do you think he was being racially abused? Yeah. No doubt. Our blocks were sort of overmanned, like, you know, we had, we had too many people. This was after Afghan. So they put a couple of blokes in there that were mates that were happy to move in sort of thing, but, I mean, they moved Dave in there. Um, they moved another, another black guy in there, Kajabi, another good mate of mine, and a couple of others as well, just to get them out of the block, I think, like, you know? And people would always be like, oh, it fucking stinks in there and all this sort of stuff, like, you know? Because of the colour of the skin. If the racial banter, as you call it, came from his superiors, how could he challenge that? <sighs> no chance. What's particularly sad about David's case is it seems that the army lost a brilliant soldier. I'm keen to find out if the problems I'm hearing about from former soldiers are still affecting people today. Last year, the Army set up a new team to encourage reporting of bullying, harassment and discrimination and to try and prevent it happening in the first place. It's headed up by Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Buxton. How widespread do you think the issue of racism is in the Army? To say that there is no racism in the Army would be absolutely incorrect. There is racism in the Army, just like there is bullying, just like there's sexism. I don't think that the Army is institutionally racist. Captain Danny Cowsland's family told him not to join the Army, but he has no regrets. You have experienced racism in the army? Yes. Were you worried that raising concerns might affect your career? I just went for it. I didn't actually consider that because I, I saw something I didn't like and I acted on it. Can I speak for other people? Other people might be worried about it. The tragedy of all this is that people are put off of the army by the actions of a few racists. If the army fails to correct racist behavior, it risks being taken to court a £490,000 payment for racial discrimination went to the man I'm about to meet. Enoki is one of hundreds of Fijians who joined the British Army in search of a new life. Are you proud of, are you proud of this? I love the Army. And what happened to me, I don't want any other soldiers to go through it. Cheers. Chief amongst the evidence in Enoki's case was a doll, which the unit found in Cyprus and nicknamed after him. He wrote my name across the belly of, the, of this troll doll. It's a black troll doll. It has a uh, fridge here uh, and a big nose. What did your sergeant say when you said you wanted this to be removed? Uh, he said, this is just army banter, all this. This is all army banter. That's how they justify it. One of the other pieces of evidence in Enoki's case was a training video in which he and other Fijians were made to play the enemy. You've got to condition the ballot features. These are the friendly forces. Be aware. You, all, you, all know you can see they are all white soldiers. So these are Fijians? Yeah. All, all Fijians. Playing the Taliban? Playing the Taliban soldiers here. That's me there. That's you? Yeah. How did it make you feel when you were asked to do this? 
made me feel like a, a second-class soldier. Uh, the army recruits heavily from the Commonwealth. In fact, over two-thirds of regular soldiers who identify as black were born abroad. Anoki says that Commonwealth soldiers are particularly vulnerable to racist abuse. Where are we going? I'm taking you to my mate. His name is Ratu. He was a victim of a brutal attack. Do you think it was racially motivated? Yes. Okay, let's go see. Him. How do you two know each other? Um, I came from Fiji with uh, Ratu here. We enjoyed it. Not all of the, our army service was was bad. It was most of it were good. We are not blaming the whole army as a whole. Uh, we have some very good officers, um, and and some who were just rotten into the core. Yeah. Ratu says he was the victim of what he believes was a racially motivated physical attack. Can you tell me what happened in Cyprus? That's where I got assaulted. Yeah. By two white soldiers. I was in the bar until the bar owner said the bar is closed now. You have to make your way out. Just before I reached the door, they, uh, they start hitting me at the back, the back of my head. Jump on me till I fall, I, I fall down. When I, I was lying down and they start kicking me, stepping all over my body, on my head. They hold a brick and they smash it right there on my, on my left hand side, on my ear. So I can hear them talking, saying, let's drag him in the bush. They, they, they were planning to hide my body there because I wasn't moving anymore. Do you think it was racially motivated? Yes. Ratu believes he was attacked for being black, but he has no evidence to prove that. But even if you set that aside, the case raises another issue that could be about race. Ratu was told the men he accused would be dealt with by the military's prosecution service. He says when he came out of hospital, he was given £5,000 and a vacation home to Fiji, but he never learnt the outcome of the case. I don't know if this is normal, so I've arranged to meet a lawyer who specialises in complaints against the army. Uh, Ratu approached me a while back uh, asking for some advice about a potential civil claim and I found it very distressing and worrying that he had such little information about what he had been through and what had happened to the people who had attacked him. He says no statement was taken from him. Uh, what do you make of that? In the way that police are meant to progress their investigations is to have the the, the victim at the very centre of that investigation. Justice needs to be done, but also the victim needs some sense of closure. So it would seem to me that he's being encouraged to forget about what happened. And if that is the case, then that is certainly wrong um, and needs to be investigated. Do you think it would have resulted in the same outcome if a white soldier made this complaint? I have my doubts that this would have happened if a white soldier was making these sort of complaints. I was keen to help Ratu find out what actually happened to the soldiers he says attacked him. And I managed to track one of them down. Hello. Hello, Andrew, it's Callum. Hello, you're OK. We're basically making a film about the black and Asian experience in the British Army. Yeah. Um, and we've we've been looking uh, sort of at, at a couple of, of incidents, and, and your name's come up. Because we've already got the other version of events from from the victim, so we need we need we need yours really. <laughs> no chance, no chance. I've had this before. I ended up in prison in Cyprus in a city of the Turkish prison, and I've been over. It. Yeah, but Andrew, we're we're not the <laughs> we're not the we're not the police, mate. You have to work hard to gain my trust, you, you know. Okay, no I'm way. I'm saying you won't, but you have to work very hard, mate. Understood. All right, all right. I'm willing to do that. We can we could we could come up on Sunday. Sunday. Oh, is it keen, aren't you? Um, come on, then. I'll speak, I'll speak to you Sunday. Nice one, Andrew. All right, see you soon. Mate. See you, see you. Didn't expect that. Let's go to Liverpool. I already know from the army 
that the Royal Military Police investigated the attack on Ratu. Andrew? Yes. Callum. Hello, Callum. You OK, mate? It's good to meet you. All right? Yeah, sure. How are you doing? Should we go for the war? Yeah, yeah. Andrew joined the army when he was 22 in order to escape his hometown and build a career. The military's prosecution service decided there was no realistic prospect of a conviction in Ratu's case, so no charges were brought. I questioned who you were, actually, if you, if you, what you were, who I thought you were. You'd have just come through me door looking for me, so... <laughs> <laughs> Some things are best left alone, aren't they? People come and knocking at your door. What are you worried about? Military police? Yeah, because, obviously, in Telic 9, we, we were involved in a lot of stuff. A lot of shootings, a lot of bombings. What do you make of the whole recruitment process? They're recruiting the wrong kind of people with this whole snowflake palaver. What do you mean by These that? These people who are easily offended or, like, they're scared of being cold and wet. Everyone should be like me, you know what I mean? But <laughs> <laughs> they can't be. <laughs> You know, one of the things we're doing is looking at the, the experience of black and Asian people within the army being bullied, yeah. you know, receiving racist abuse. From what I witnessed, my time in the army was that more race cards are pulled out than actual racist events. Someone started doing something wrong, put other people in danger. When he gets questioned about it, they pull a race card out. When, like, uh, black and brown people get a hard time, it's just, why do you think it is? It's just... A lot of the time, it's because they're shit. They're falling behind on runs all the time. That Their admin in camp is shit, or they're just shit. That, so they get a hard time for it, and then the longer it goes on, they, uh, they, they tend to cry about it. Instead of addressing whatever it is they're doing wrong, they just go, oh, no, you're a racist. And I've seen it with my own eyes, because I'm not a racist man at all, me. But I've been called one. Andrew remembers the incident in Cyprus completely differently from Ratu, who he calls by his nickname, B. Me and another lad went out to watch the football. B was already out. I knew B anyway. I knew a lot of Fijians. They'd been out all day. And if anyone else would tell you, when Fijians have been out drinking, they're wild. They're not, they're like, they're not, you can't be around them because they'll just start attacking each other, attacking anyone. And B's decided to start attacking the lad who I was with. It was a drunken brawl. Instigated by him, by B himself. It went wrong. But after that, he says he was dragged into a bush. And he wasn't. And, and left for dead. It's, it's, it's lies. It's all lies. Race card. That was it. It was the end of it. The reason why soldiers of a black and ethnic minority don't talk out sometimes is because they're just scared of people saying, you're playing the race card. And what did you hear just there? Oh, they're just playing the race card. Playing the race card is a phrase some say is used to cover the fact that minorities are held to a different, higher standard than their white counterparts. I want to find out how Ratu and Anoki felt about what Andrew had said. They just start attacking each other, attacking anyone. And Bees decided to start attacking the lad who I was with. It was a drunken brawl instigated by him, by B himself. It went wrong. But after that, he says he was dragged into a bush. <laughs> and he wasn't. And, and left for dead. It's, it's, it's lies. It's all lies. <laughs> He's the one who was doing the fighting. <laughs> Put the blame on me. Why, like? What's your reaction to seeing that? He's basically saying you were drunk, you started a fight, and now you're using the race card to blame them. It's totally a different thing what happened. He said, so he used it the other way around. He said, I'm trying to play the race card. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to, I've been through it. We'll never know the truth about what happened to Ratu, but it certainly doesn't help that the army never provided him with an account of the investigation. I want to revisit Mark Barrett. I can't quite get those racist messages he wrote out of my head. He said the sort of comments he shared would be on 90% of soldiers' phones. But I think that's rubbish. When he says he doesn't understand what he was doing, he's either a liar 
or he's extremely stupid. I want to find out what he feels about the content of these messages today and whether he feels any remorse for what he originally told me is merely dark humour. One of the things you said on the group was, this is referring to Muslims, mm -hmm. eventually the world will see them for what they are and the war will begin. No sorrow or remorse for those sickening degenerates. I, I don't see the humour in that. It was about the attacks in London. Um, the people that stabbed them people on the bridge, um, everyone was quite badly annoyed at that and stupid things were said at that point. And, you know, I regret saying things like that because that's pretty bad. You posted, like, an image of the Ku Klux Klan and a black man hanging from, from a tree. You posted a picture of US President Donald Trump with the slogan, Spicks and niggers need to hang from trees. Now I'm out of the army and I'm living a different life. I look back and you hear of these jokes, and even nowadays when I see some of the friends that I know in the army, they'll try and say a joke, and I'm just like, Phew, Jesus, mate, calm down a bit. The messaging group Mark was in was called Triple K Mafia. As we are walking back, he reveals that there were two other soldiers added to the group, though they both chose to leave shortly afterwards. So these guys were, they were in the same messaging group? Yeah. One left the army, one still serving. Yeah. Did you know them? Yeah, I knew both of them. Um, both of them are actually close friends of mine. Uh, the one who's still serving, he, was, he spent Christmas Day with us. Since talking to Mark, we've been trying to find out more about the two soldiers he mentioned and whether the army ever investigated them. It's led us to three pieces of evidence presented in his trial. First is a picture of Jordan Orme. He was a serving member of the British Army, and here is a picture of him on an army base stood next to a burning cross, firing a bow and arrow in broad daylight. This was taken in Mark Barrett's garden. There's another photo. This is of a Nazi cake, which was apparently provided by Scott Parker for Mark's birthday. And then finally, there's a message from Vevelinen. It says this, can you add these two numbers these are two more committed Nazis in the army, referring to Scott Parker and Jordan Orm. I know them both, and so does Mark. I don't know if there is any truth in the suggestion that they're Nazis. But I do want to find out if any of this evidence was investigated by the army. So I asked Lieutenant Colonel Buxton and Captain Cowslin back in Plymouth what they would expect to happen. Jordan Orme, who was pictured next to this burning cross, is still serving to this day. One of the sayings we have is that, you know, you are the standard you walk past. I would never walk past that. No one of an ethnic minority in the British Army would ever walk past that. There are plenty of examples within the military where somebody has made one comment on Facebook and it's been reported to the chain of command and they've been removed from post immediately and they have been disciplined for it. The Army would not give any detail on whether Jordan Orme or Scott Parker faced investigation. Each of us has a responsibility to make sure that our great institution, the British Army, is a place where everybody can thrive and an institution that our nation is proud of. The Army does want to recruit from every community and ethnicity in Britain. But if it actually wants to achieve this, I really think it needs to be tougher on itself. If we truly care about our army being the best, then it needs to be free of racism and racists. <laughs>